welcome everybody to JNL Shooting Academy. Uh, this is our premiere debut video. Um, like I said on my other channel, Thoughts of an Old Soldier Today, we're going to get our debut video out today. And uh, the subject, and I, I've done this video before, but we're going to be talking about the 38 Smith & Wesson. Um, just a little bit about the history of it, uh, just to give you an idea, and of course it's unloaded, as you can see here, no rounds in the cylinder. Just going to kind of give a brief history overview, um, a little comparison with another American classic firearm, the 1911 A1. Uh, part of the whole thing with 38 was at the end of the Indian Wars, Plains Wars, whichever way you want to term it. Um, somebody way up high in the, what they called back then the War Department, decided that the Army needed to get away from this size caliber cartridge, which this is a 45 ACP. Um, the primary, one of the primary firearms was the 1873 uh, single action army which fired a 45 Colt which is a little bit longer but caliber wise roughly the same diameter in order to save money and weight and things like that they decided they needed to go with something about that size this is a 38 Smith & Wesson if you'll note it, it is not a 38 Special it's 38 Smith & Wesson Smith & Wesson it's much shorter than 38 Special okay um, as far as comparison wise, it's probably in the ballpark of close to or similar to a nine millimeter in size, but not punch. All right. But if y'all can see here, so basically the army went from this to this, as far as calibers are concerned. Okay. So let's fast forward now to the end of the 19th century 1898 um the uss maine blows up in havana harbor and it's decided that we're going to go to war with spain to free the cuban people of the oppression from the spanish empire um eventually that would spill over into the philippines and later on the philippine insurrection etc and so forth well at this point in time the army had started arming the, the regular army had started being armed with a, a 38 caliber firearm. Likewise, the Philippine insurrection begins 38 caliber. Um, so somewhere in that ballpark. I, I want to say during the actual Spanish-American War in Cuba, most army officers had a, a 45 caliber firearm. Um, and there, shortly thereafter, they standardized to a 38 Smith & Wesson caliber. Um, and then we found out during the, the Philippine insurrection that this wasn't going to stop a, uh, a mayor, may, ugh, can't talk today, Maori warrior all hopped up. And especially the big wicker basket shields they would carry. This bullet couldn't penetrate. A lot of officers opted out of their own pocket to purchase 45 caliber firearm to carry with them. Um... But long story short, this pistol was developed somewhere about 1905, okay? This is what's referred to as the Victory Model Smith & Wesson. They were issued um, as a standard sidearm, per se. Uh, a lot of security and police forces adopted these for their training because it's easy to train with the round, doesn't have much recoil. Okay. Let's fast forward now to World War I. Great Britain is in dire need of handguns. They've got the 455 Webley. Um, they've also got the 455 Enfield. But their army is only, I think, 200 and some odd thousand strong when they initially sent the British Expeditionary Force to France to fight with the French army and the Belgian army uh, against the Germans when Germany started coming into France. Um, 
in the rapid expansion of the British Army, they needed more arms. So, Webley designed a 38 pistol that fired this cartridge, but only in a 200 grain bullet. This right here is a 38 Smith Wesson 158 grain bullet. Okay, um, Webley designed one and 38 caliber 200 grain. Uh, many of these Smith and Wessons were sent over to equip the, the British and their Commonwealth forces. Many of these pistols saw action in the Canadian military. Um, not only in World War I, but World War II uh, to fill a need that the, the British had. But they also found their way into U.S. military units, um, rear echelon primarily. But the other part, too, some pilots carried this type of pistol. Uh, why? Revolver's easier to use if you're in a parachute harness than, say, a 1911 in the sense if you, if you flew and you forgot to rack around when you got in your cockpit and flew, you know, flew out. You could pull this out and shoot it one-handed um, right off the bat, whereas if you had this and you forgot to, you'd have to two-hand it and then put it into action. It's not to say that it didn't happen, but that was one reason many pilots preferred a revolver versus an auto-loader uh, pistol. But again, the end of World War II, several of these pistols found their way coming back to the United States after being on Lend-Lease. Uh, and again, right back to police training academies, security companies, um, but even the U.S. military, because this one still got the U.S. government property stamp right across here. I don't know if you can see that on there or not. Um, lighting in my office is not the greatest in the world right now, and neither is my phone camera. But right across in here, um, it basically states... Uh, U.S. property, and then we've got the whole Smith & Wesson manufacturing um, piece here, okay? It's a nice piece to shoot. Uh, right now, ammunition is kind of getting hard to find for it, but it's a typical military and police revolver of the Smith & Wesson style frame to include the lanyard loop, okay? That would be where you'd hook a lanyard onto it, so if you dropped it, you didn't lose it. Um, it's perfect for lieutenants that don't know what they're doing. You make sure you dummy cord their weapon to them at all times. Uh, and again, most military pistols, like even this, this auto ordnance 45 GI model, it's got the lanyard loop right here in the main, you know, uh, buffer spring housing here. Um, I'm a loss for terms today. Been out in the heat all day, but right in here where you'd hook it. But again, the advent of, you know, somebody initially up in the War Department wanting to save money decides this is going to be an adequate cartridge to stop our enemies with. Now, there were some models made, uh, from what I've read, that were chambered in 38 Special, which if you know the difference, a 38 Special carries quite a bit more punch than this little thing. It's not to say this wouldn't stop somebody, but this was more designed as a training um, and target round than a, you know, a man stop around, if you will. Um, and again, these saw service in World War One, World War Two, various other theaters. I wouldn't be surprised what some people had these in the Korean War. Uh, and again, like I said, some models were chambered in 38 Special. And you'll know because if you try to take a 38 Special round and put in this one, it's not going to fit. Um, trust me, I know, because when I first bought the pistol, I wasn't paying attention. I just grabbed a box of 38 Special uh, when I left where I bought it, got home, realized it wouldn't go all the way in, started doing my research, and that's when I found out it fired 38 Smith & Wesson. And someone said, well, you can take a, a 38 Colt, I think what they said, um, and uh, shorten it. No, we're not going to play that game. We're just going to go and find the right ammunition uh and that's what we did again love shooting this thing um but again a lot of these went over on lend lease and saw a service with our british and canadian and australian and new zealand counterparts um it's a fairly heavy firearm it's got some heft to it so you know in, in close quarters you can turn around and use this thing as a club knock somebody over the head with it it's gonna hurt 
um, or if you drop it on your toe like Barney Fife did, you know, and Andy Griffith. I think he carried something similar to this. He might have been actually had the Smith & Wesson 45 on the larger frame. Um, either way it goes, it's still a very similar model. Now, the other thing, too, somebody says, well, how do you know it's Smith & Wesson? Besides the fact it says Smith & Wesson, if you ever see one of these at a distance, because at the end, like, Colt, that's got to be a Colt. No, it's not a Colt. Reason right here. This right here is another indicator, probably Smith & Wesson, where the rod, the ejector rod, locks into place up here and it gives it some measure of protection whereas most colts didn't have this and the ejector rod was a little bit lower and you can kind of see a gap between the ejector rod and the barrel um but this is another kind of indicator if you if you're seeing it at a distance that chances are this is a um smith and wesson and it's a very simple a front blade sight with i don't know if you can see it here but the v-notch rear aperture and that, that's pretty much your sight and when shooting this the hard part when you aim is that the hammer has a tendency to get in the way of your notch in double action mode that's the other thing this is a single action double action pistol well, what does that mean single action i cock every shot bang fired okay or i can shoot in double action bang 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 so in that mode right there it's sometimes kind of hard to line up that v-notch um, whereas in single action, the hammer's out of the way, and I can see right down that V-notch to the top of the front of the sight post, or sight blade in this case. Um, but even then, at the end of the day, that's still a, a joy to shoot. Um, a lot of times, I'll take this one out with me when I'm cutting grass in the yard, especially on the back 40 in the range, you know, in case Jake No Shoulder shows up, or, you know, my friendly neighborhood idiotic coyotes show up, okay? And again, just want to share this with you today to get our debut video out um we'll be talking more about the history of firearms and the other thing too don't look at me as a subject matter expert on the history of these things I, I'm, I'm more of an amateur historian if i get something mixed up or a fact missed a fact or misrepresented fact i apologize now um correct me down in the comments below or if you've got some information that i failed to share please put it down in the comments below share with the group um that way we all benefit from that knowledge you know, uh, knowledge is power. And again, it's a great piece. Um, of course, Smith & Wesson has always made quality firearms for, you know, years on end. And again, like I said, another main staple of the U.S. military was the 1911. Uh, and it, too, was adopted by many of our allied nations during World War I, World War II. Britain bought a boatload of them after they got their butts handed to them at Dunkirk. Um, they had to re-equip an entire army. Um, and of course, we s gladly supplied them, okay? We gladly supplied them for a, for a period of time. And again, like I said, a lot of these went out over on Lend Lease. And then when they came back to the States, again, they re-equipped police academies, security companies, things of that nature. Um, even the US military continued to use it for years as a training weapon, again, it's cheaper to buy these than it is these to train somebody how to shoot a revolver. Okay. Um, especially if they're going to be on like a, a rear echelon or a static guard post, you know. Um, and some of the other research I heard, you know, or read up on is this particular model, Victory model. Many of them were bought, and like I said, by private security companies. And you'd see them throughout the nation back when security companies had kind of their uniforms kind of married the local police departments in a sense. You know, you'd see these in a big old leather holster like this hanging off Barney Fife's leg, you know, uh, at the end of the day. And, you know, most of the security guys, it probably never never left that holster. But, you you know, if you've seen them, the, the security guard had this on their hip with their little gun belt with their two other pouches with speed loaders or their six loose rounds was another method of training with revolvers before speed loaders became a thing with revolvers um now this, like i said this particular leather holster is, is brown most of your law enforcement would be black and that kind of thing i think this holster off a sportsman's guide to hold it um stand by i'll show you another one i've got for this piece mm.
in the U.S. military. You know, a little shoulder holster. It was designed for revolvers right now. I'm using it for my dry erase markers to for my dry erase board for the business. But again, this was designed more for, believe it or not, aviators. Uh, and, you know, some tankers got them too. A lot of paratroopers would get a hold of them. But again, this was designed for a 38 revolver, whether it was a 38 Smith & Wesson or a 38 Special, okay? And it was just a simple, you know, you slip it over your, your neck like so. It had your belt clip here, and that's what kept it in place. And it'd be right here on the side, ready to go. Um, it's not technically a tanker's holster. It's just a shoulder holster. A tanker holster actually has a strap that comes around across the chest. Got one of those hanging up on the wall that um, I carried with me in Iraq for a year when I had my M9 Beretta that the Army had issued me. And I was so glad to get rid of that pistol. It's not even funny. It was a piece of garbage. But anyway, folks, tell me what you think down at the in the description below. You know, share, like, hit the like button, hit the share button, subscribe to the channel. We'd love to have you. We want to hear your comments on this. Also, give me some indications of some things you want to see on this channel. This channel is designed strictly for shooting and firearm history. Um, if, you know, all the other stuff I normally talk about, we'll continue to talk about on Thoughts of an Old Soldier. Uh, but this one going to be dedicated to gun issue, or not, not issues, but gun history, shooting, various things of that nature. But you tell me down in the comments below, you the subscribers going to drive the train on this, on what content we put on here as far as gun related matters. And I, I really look forward to hearing from each and every one of you on this. And please share this with your friends. Any of those that are anybody's interested in shooting, anybody's interested in, in gun history. Um, and we'll start to broaden this channel uh, every chance we get. Um, next week, I will be in Chattaboogie. But even then, I'm going to try and get one out, and I'll give you a heads up uh, when that's going to come out. And um, trying to think what platform we'll talk about. Might do one on the M1 paratrooper carbine, or we might one do one on the P17 Enfield rifle. Um, my best friend, who I'll be with, has both of those. Uh, the P17, I think, is going to be an interesting one to talk about. Um, and let you know more about that when we get ready to do that video. But until then, my friends, y'all stay safe, take care, God bless, appreciate each and every one of you, and we'll see you soon. This is from JL Shooting Academy. Thank you again. Take care.